I'll talk from here because this is being recorded, but I would like to acknowledge Laurent. Laurent initiated this partnership, and uh, as you can see, he's very easy to work with. <laughs> so that's been, that's been an absolute pleasure, and, and I think it's these rich partnerships and engagement with colleagues, with you know, related interests, which is such an important part of, uh, of academic work. What I'd like to do this evening is take a very broad view of um, considering the kind of challenges which vocational education as a sector faces and how the, s the sector might respond to some of those challenges. Uh, the presentation necessarily will be very broad because I'll be drawing upon a range of studies from different countries, but there are some themes here that I think are are central to how vocational education systems across, particularly across to countries with advanced industrial economies, can uh, face some of the challenges, which are often referred to as 21st century skills. There is, however, one topic I won't be addressing this evening, uh, and that's possibly the, the biggest issue for vocational education, and that is the standing of vocational education is often seen as being quite low, and this has huge impacts upon um, government policy, government interest, engagement by the community, and the issues of, um, of how parents advise and teachers advise young people um, to p pursue post-school pathways. And certainly in my country, and I know other countries, there's a real concern that young people are not engaging in vocational education and the preference is to go to higher education and there are, s there are a series of consequences from that. But that's a topic perhaps for another time and another day. The other thing I'd like to say is that although here I'm referring to vocational education, much of what I have to say relates to higher education and often I use the term tertiary education which encompasses both vocational education and higher education. And that's often helpful because as you look across countries, countries have systems of a different kind and sometimes, for instance, in the Netherlands, you find vocational education and higher education merging together. But to the talk, and the key argument I want to make is that changes in occupational and workplace requirements and working life suggests that perhaps a fresh focus is required on the goals and processes of vocational education. By the way, I should say that this PowerPoint will be available to you after the talk. And um, this includes addressing specific workplace requirements as well as occupational competence. And that increasingly there's this concern about um, developing skills for the digital world, this symbolic and conceptual knowledge which is often seen as being difficult um, to access and learn. And then developing both the canonical knowledge of the occupation, the knowledge which is required to enact that occupation, but also its situational variance so that individuals can meet the needs of particular workplace requirements. And the need for um, adaptable, intentional, active learners for students to become that, not only for their initial occupational preparation, but for continuing to learn across working life. I think there's strong consensus now that an initial occupational preparation, no matter how good it is, will be insufficient for a person to be competent across working life. A couple of years ago, I had a conversation with a senior, a very senior consultant, medical consultant, and I said to him, I suspect much of what you learned in medical school 30 or 40 years ago has remained the same because it deals with principles of physiology. And he said, no, not at all. That the whole, even that knowledge which is fundamental has changed so much that the same issues play out across many occupations, it seems. Um, central here is the concept of adaptability um, within domains of occupational practice, how people can be adaptable 
and the importance of interdependence, individuals engaging with the world around them, with others, artifacts, etc. And this requires considerations for curriculum and pedagogic practices to achieve those kinds of arguments, uh, outcomes, I, I, I would argue. Okay, so how I'd like to progress is first divide the talk into two sections, elaborate some of those challenges, the key changes that are occurring, and then secondly then discuss the, the pedagogic and curriculum responses to it. In terms of the former, as I've indicated, uh, focus on occupational preparation and job readiness, securing um, hard to learn knowledge, developing adaptability and interdependence, and then the focus on, growing focus on continuing vocational education and training. And then in terms of curriculum responses, how can we make experiences within educational institutions more aligned with the kind of knowledge that students need to learn? Secondly, how we can organize and provide workplace experiences for our students? And secondly, how can we integrate those two sets of experiences to achieve the kind of goals that are required? And then fourthly, a, 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 an intentional focus on developing adaptability, securing hard to, hard to learn knowledge, promoting learner agency, and then finally, how we might think about provisions of continuing education and training. So a fair bit to get through. Yep. And I'm, I do, I do apologise, I should have said at the beginning that it's very nice to be here again, but unfortunately my French has not improved in that time. So, <laughs> um, I, um, so I apologise for speaking entirely in English. So anyway, okay. So some of the key changes. Now, there's been a strong focus on tertiary education, on vocational education, but also higher education, to prepare students or graduates for occupations. In my country, for the last 30 years, there's been a big focus on developing national competency standards. And th that is in vocational education, but also for the professions, for standards for nursing, for accountants, et cetera, for teachers. And what we've been told is that the, the, the key focus of tertiary education has been to prepare people for occupations. But things have changed recently, and what we're being told is that now employers, employers, governments, and community, and students themselves are now expecting graduates to be job ready. There's a considerable difference here between educational goals and processes associated with addressing, developing, um, securing occupational knowledge per se, and the kind of processes and goals associated with meet, meeting um, uh, the needs of particular workplaces. This is a really tough educational goal for three reasons. Firstly, we don't know where our graduates will end up. Now, if occupational practice was the same in every workplace, it wouldn't be a problem. However, the requirements for occupational practices varies enormously across workplaces of different kinds, geographical settings, et cetera, et cetera. So in the state I live in, in Queensland, which is a huge state, the Poisons Act has been relaxed so that nurses can administer medicine some distance away from Brisbane. The point is that if the nurses weren't able to do some prescription, there would be nobody to do it. So there's particular requirements that come from, for instance, living in a large state that has concentrated areas of, of, of population and limited population. So what, for instance, a nurse, a doctor, a physiotherapist does in a large hospital in Brisbane is going to be very, very different than what they do in a small regional hospital or an, an Aboriginal community, for instance. Very different indeed. So we don't know where our graduates will end up. So it's difficult then to meet those needs when we don't know what those needs might be. Secondly, um, this requires quite different educational objectives and processes than occupational preparation because we need to prepare um, students so that they can meet the specific needs of workplaces, not statements about occupational competence. And thirdly, this extends to the so-called 21st century skills that are associated with 
complex problem solving, critical thinking, people management, and coordination. And I think to achieve these goals, this requires knowing something about variations or different forms of the occupational practices and why those practices are different, for what reasons, and um, how those broader capacities such as complex problem solving, critical thinking might play out in the particular situation of practice. Um, um, however, I actually think this is a legitimate and worthwhile challenge. Presumably the project of education, and I use that term very broadly, is that our graduates, graduates from education will have the capacities to apply their knowledge in different ways in different places. So I don't actually see this as being inconsistent with the, the broader project of education, that our graduates should be able to adapt and utilize in different ways the knowledge they have learned within educational programs. Um, this um, positions occupational adaptability as a key educational goal. And um, yet, as um, Rea Hanalin says, yet government's concerns focus on statements of competence rather than processes securing these kinds of outcomes. Um, Rea is a, a scholar from Finland. So let's think about adaptability. Going back over time, um, early view suggested that some kinds of knowledge were inherently um, adaptable. Bartlett proposed that, and it was said, for instance, that some forms such as literacy and numeracy were broadly applicable. In the 1970s, when first faced with this challenge about how we should prepare school children and people in tertiary education for the changing world of work, Fayer et al said that we shouldn't teach students content anymore. We should just give them general problem-solving skills, that this is what is needed. And you've probably heard in recent times corporations like Google saying, we don't want people with specific skills. Give us people with general skills, and we will give them the job-specific skills. OK, that's fine. But what studies of expertise clearly indicate that the ability to problem solve, to engage in critical thinking, to adapt knowledge, is derived from having a, a strong domain-specific body of <coughs> knowledge. And that we find when we look at general problem solving that the potency of general problem solving is quite weak. And some scholars have, been, have suggested that it is helpful only insofar as look before you leap, think before you act. But beyond that, you actually need a domain of knowledge to engage in those kind of activities. And that clearly comes from about three decades of concentrated research within studies of expertise. The importance of, of a domain-specific body of knowledge and expertise being associated with the ability to engage in non-routine problem solving. And recently, and this is my work, um, the, um, the, the realization that occupational performance and expertise is highly situated. Um, this means that competence at both the occupational and situational level is necessary. Yes, it's important to have the canons of the occupation, but we need to know how it's applied in particular situation and adaptability across them. Now, we've gone down this track before. I don't know if you're familiar with Leonard Cohen, the Canadian songwriter. One of his songs talk, talks about, I've met that kind of man before. And I'm constantly reminded when these things come up. And because in the past, this, this, this current interest on 21st century skills, we've met that kind of man before. Um, we, had from a, we had the key competencies in a number of countries and from America, we had scans. And what we found that in researching these is that these generic skills, unless they're embedded in a particular occupation, a sort of domain of knowledge, 
are limited in their ability to adapt. Now, I'll just explain. This is the kind of three kinds of knowledge that I find helpful to think about. There's conceptual knowledge, procedural knowledge, and dispositional knowledge. Conceptual knowledge is, is, is what we know, and the Americans refer to it as declarative knowledge. That is knowledge that you can speak or write down. Then there's procedural knowledge, and that is what, how we achieve goals. And achieving goals also includes thinking. So as you're thinking about this stuff now, you're actually engaging procedures to understand these words and perhaps under try and understand them in French. Um, and then there's dispositions, the values that sit behind it. And all of these three forms of knowledge are enacted as we think and act. So as you're thinking about things, you, 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 you're using your procedures, and how you, how you value things will shape the amount of effort, for instance, you put in thinking about things and how you come to conceptualize it. So for instance, imagine that you were taking a concept, such as the American president. <laughs> what you might do is engage in thinking and doing a comparison between the current and the previous American president, for instance. Now that process would engage in you in thinking and about making comparisons. And within that, you might have views about the current American president compared with the previous one. And how you might conceptualize how um, an American president might act. So those three forms of knowledge come together when you're conceptualizing something, but also when you're out there on the street driving or doing any other kind of activities, these three forms of knowledge I hold um, are enacted. And when we talk about occupational knowledge, we have these three forms of knowledge um, as part of the canonical knowledge of the occupation. And just reinforcing the, the, the importance of situational performance. I propose that there's no such thing as a vocational expert per se. There's no such thing as a, 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 an expert doctor, nurse, or teacher. That expertise can only be demonstrated in the particular circumstances in which you engage. And you could be a, a wonderful, competent teacher in one situation and find in another situation that your skills are, are wholly inadequate. So we need to take into account the situation. And as Petri Nokalelen, Love the Finnish names, they're just really difficult, aren't they? Yeah. And uh, what Petri says is occupational competence is shaped by the circumstance of practice and again, complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management and coordinating with others. So he's using those skills to say that this is, these are the requirements of occupational competence. And when we have these three forms of knowledge, knowledge, um, a, a, a Know-how goes from simple factual knowledge through to uh, links and associations that are, that are causal. So from simple knowledge you can um, recite through to um, causal links and associations. So when your doctor is diagnosing your health condition, they're engaging in clinical reasoning, which is of that higher order. Then we have specific procedures of doing individual tasks through to um, strategic thinking about developing an entire project. And then we have dispositional knowledge, which is about interest and intentionality and, uh, and disposition. And uh, situational manifestation is about what permits job performance in that particular workplace. What we do here is and the particular kinds of what is need to be known can be done and valued in that workplace. So what th there are three domains of knowledge that are central to vocational education and also tertiary education more broadly, I would hold. Firstly is the, the canonical knowledge of the occupation, the kind of knowledge which anybody who's practicing that occupation needs to know. Then there's the situational domain of knowledge, with us, with us, which is the circumstance of practice. Now, the first one of these often ends up as being statements about occupational competence and requirements, but it's actually disembedded from practice. 
And it's only in s the actual circumstances of practice that that kind of knowledge is enacted. And I think perhaps most importantly for us as educators, the concern is the, the development of a personal domain of knowledge that is constructed through experience. And for vocational education, our concern is to address the two, first two of those domains and generating the third in our students, I hold. So the second thing is this knowledge which is, is, is difficult to learn, this symbolic and conceptual knowledge. Going back to 1985, Sylvia Scribner, who's a, one of the first socioculturalists, said that Hardly have we approached the problem of understanding the intellectual impact of the printing press than we are urged to confront the psychological implications of computerization. That was 1985. You can imagine the challenge which has come across in, in that short period of time. It's also important to remember, who remembers Three Mile Island? Three Mile Island, remember that one? I'm trying to, that was when a power station in America almost blew up because the operators didn't have an understanding of how the power station worked. They had an understanding of the operating system, but not actually how the power station worked. And then Chernobyl, and then we have other examples of the importance of symbolic knowledge in contemporary um, work. And as Vanberg has suggested that pilots are becoming the children of magenta, <coughs> over-reliance on Ma uh, magenta lines on their cockpit displays. That is, they're, um, they're being abstracted, their learning is and performance is abstracted from the things that perhaps fly planes. Um, and the, the good example that came from the work of Martin and Scribner in the early 1990s was the introduction of computer numerically controlled lathes and what that meant for traditional metal workers. So when I was a schoolboy in Britain many years ago, I learned how to shape metal on something like that. This is a manual lathe. And there's all of this sensory input. As you, the thing turns around, it makes a lot of noise. And then you turn a dial and it's vibrations coming through it. <coughs> and you move the tool into the metal and a noise occurs. And then there's coolant which is coming on the metal. So you, and which makes a smell. So you have vibration, sensory input, you have noise, you have, um, the c you look at the swarf which is coming off and if it's too burnt you know you're trying to do it too quickly. You have all of this sensory input and these were the kind of skills that metal workers had for many years. And then came along these things. Well what you do is you put coordinates into a computer, press a button and walk away. And I'm sure you can appreciate the difference in the knowledge required to um, work these two systems and the difficulties that workers who were familiar with this mode had transferred into that mode. And it was said in Scribner and Martin's study that moving on to this type of equipment, the skills were more aligned to a computer programmer rather than a metal machinist. <coughs> and um, this knowledge is often difficult to learn and it, as it cannot be engaged with or experienced directly. Uh, and that's even more interesting because the Americans, as I said, describe this as knowledge that you could declare uh, and write down, but this knowledge isn't of that kind. And there are differences in capacities and familiarities across generations. So we have this idea that if you, you're, if you don't know how to use your phone or your computer, you go and find a 17-year-old because they can assist you. But really, it's just simply the set of experiences they've had. My daughter, one of her first toys was a um, little Tamagotchi thing. Remember those little things? And she would press buttons and little icons. So she grew up in an era where um, digitized artifacts were just part of her life. So it's not so much that <coughs> folk like, dare, dare I say, folk like us? Yeah, they probably. Um, struggle with technology. It's, it's just what, you, what you've grown up with, what you've developed and, and <coughs> used. And I see little evidence that older folk can't engage with technology. Um, so developing adaptability is important, as I've repeatedly said, but also interdependence. That is the ability to work with others, engage with others, 
and this is increasing this ST, which in extends to engaging with artifacts and text, etc. And yet, many educational provisions are premised on and are mediated individually and are more focused on developing independence. We have here this, this rhetoric of it's important to have independent learners. Yes, it's great they're independent, but it's also important that they should be interdependent because this sometimes is a far more important student outcome. Lots and lots of work requires people to work with others effectively, not just um, on, on working on your own. Now, adaptability um, is evident in the PIAC data. Now, is, uh, are people familiar with the PIAC data? I should just check. Anybody not familiar with the PIAC data? That's okay, okay. So the PIAC data is uh, it's the program of international assessment of adult competence. And it's a bit like the adult version of PISA, except that it's got all these very specific questions about adults learning through work and engaging with technology. It's been done in 32 countries, and what I found was in preparing for this talk, Switzerland isn't one of, one of them, okay? So you're not one of them. Um, so just to advise then, so in Australia, 82% um, and 48% of workers reported engaging in routine and non-routine problem solving every week in their work. And all classes of Australian workers engage in these adaptive practices each working week. And the breakup is interesting. The group that reported most frequently engaging in this problem solving were technical workers, followed by the professions, followed by skilled workers, service workers and, and operatives. Now th that's what they're reporting engaging in non-routine problem solving. And that is the, the, the kind of problem solving that requires higher order thinking, but it generates higher orders of learning and is also associated with innovations in the workplace, responding to problems. Now, um, this case is similar close by. So because Switzerland doesn't engage, I had to look at these three countries, which were your three neighbors. And I'll just explain these items here. So the first one is, um, how often does your work involve engaging in tasks where it takes you between one and five minutes to identify a solution? And I'm classifying that as non-routine problem solving. And the other question they're asked is, how often does you, your work involve in, in um, responding to problems that take between five and 30 minutes to come up with a solution? Not to do it, but to come up with a solution. And I'm classifying that as non-routine problem solving. And you'll see here that in those countries of Austria, France, and Germany, there is um, a high level of engagement in um, that at least weekly. And down here, 65.3%, 68.6% of Austrian and um, and. 71.2% of German workers reported engaging in routine uh, sol problem solving and then below 34, 37, 38 in non-routine problem solving that requires and generates higher order capacities at least weekly. Now the point here is that this is saying that people in the workplace require these capacities but also um, that by engaging in these activities, you will generate those activities. Now, um, whereas I was able to do an analysis on the Australian data in, te in terms of occupations, I wasn't able to do that because that data wasn't available for these countries. But it's wor worthwhile noting, going back to the Australian data, that we have a, a qualification framework called the Australian Qualification Framework. <laughs> And it's, it was the one that's actually has been copied and used in a lot of other countries. It, and we have levels of workers. AQF1 is a low-level worker, two, three, up to higher levels. And what's interesting is workers from all levels in that data report engaging in higher-order thinking. But if you look at the description of an AQF1 worker, it says this person has no discretion um, and has to ask other people how they proceed. And my joke is that a worker at that level has to ask their boss, not only can I go to the toilet, but 
do I need to go to the toilet? <laughs> but the evidence here is that workers at all levels engage in that higher order thinking. So that when we have these qualification frameworks, perhaps they shouldn't be horizontal. They sh sorry, they shouldn't be vertical. Perhaps they should be horizontal. That it's not a hierarchy, it's of different kinds of work across horizontally rather than saying one is more higher than the other. Um, so it, so for, for this analysis, I looked at levels of education and across those countries, and you probably can't see that at the back, but essentially um, it, it's saying that in these three countries, workers at all levels of educational achievement down here, and I couldn't increase that font, I beg your pardon, um, engage in complex problem solving. There's also a question about, or questions about the discretion that workers have in their workplace. <coughs> And you'll see here, there are three questions here about can you choose the sequence of your work, change main working tasks, and change the pace of your work? And what you'll see, ag again, is that high levels, high levels of people say, yes, they can change the nature of their work. This then suggests that these workers are exercising discretion. That means they have to be able to think critically, engage in problem solving, and respond to tasks. Um, and engage in that kind of thinking. And so all of this, yeah, all this indicates that these workers exercise decision making and problem solving in their work, thereby requiring but also extending <coughs> higher order capacities. And I guess this emphasizes the kinds of qualities which initial VET vocational education needs to generate, but also what might be utilized, used in continue education and training. I mean, what, what a good idea to use people's everyday work activity to help them develop further their knowledge <coughs> when they're engaging in problem solving and, and, and critical thinking. Um, and then this focus on continuing education and training because many countries are now shifting their focus onto continuing education and training because of aging populations, the need for constant upskilling, changes in occupations and careers, and also overwhelmed social um, systems. So last week, the treasurer of Australia um, said that he would like workers in Australia to keep working as long as possible because the tax, the burden on the, the, on the social welfare system by people retiring was, was becoming overwhelmed by demand. And yet we find that some initial models of initial um, occupational preparation are ill-suited to continuing education and training because they don't fit within the, mo the model, of, uh, sorry, the, the mode of adults' working lives and they're often focused more on administrative arrangements and so we need to sort of revisit those, um, those approaches. And for instance, it would seem that work-based models of continuing education and training uh, might be appropriate and in a study in Australia, they were favoured by workers. Okay, so how to respond to these? So what kind of curriculum and pedagogic practices can promote these capacities, including the development of conceptual and symbolic knowledge, and how can we promote learner interdependence? Um, and I'm going to try and begin to address some of these questions in the next session. So in terms of, of um, what happens within experiences provided within educational institutions, the, the research indicates that it's making educational activities authentic and promoting engagement and interdependence. This is very important for um, uh, the kind of learning which is richly indexed. It allows us to understand, to organize knowledge, and then recall it when we need to use it. Now, I'll give you an example here. When I first became a TAFE teacher, when I moved from industry into um, uh, to be a vocational teacher, um, I, by the way, my background was in clothing. I used to make men's clothes, okay? Uh, clothing manufacturer. I was a, a, called a designer, but a designer is really a technical role. And as a beginning teacher in TAFE, guess what? I got the Friday afternoon classes, okay? Does that happen here? Probably does. And I had to teach students a process called grading. Now, grading is where you have the set size. It's called it's a gendered term called the master size. For women, it's size 10. For men, it's size 34. And what you do, once you've got the pattern, 
you have to make the other sizes from it. Now, the students found this particularly boring. Okay. Many of them assumed it wasn't interesting, but second, they assumed that when they got into the workplace, somebody would be doing it for them. Okay. That's not the case. They would have to do it. So what I did was, to try and motivate and engage the students, was it was Friday afternoon, I gave them a task to do, and then that they could listen to music, because in a pattern workshop in the workplace you can listen to music, it's not a problem. And they would do their grade, I would instruct them what to do, they would do their grade, and when they'd finished their grade, they had to find somebody to swap with. Because what you always do with pattern pieces is you need to check them to make sure that you know, the seams go together, the sleeve goes into the armhole. And that's a standard process in a pattern room, because somebody does a pattern, then you get somebody else to check it, and that person then signs it. So I did that in the classroom. I said, once you've finished your job, you can go. Because these are all, you know, they're not children, so they say, go. So that engaged them in activity, and Friday afternoons were okay uh, and productive. So it's, I think it's about making educational tasks, the, the problem space authentic, impressing students into practice-related thinking. And it's also important to identify what is best to be taught and what is best to be learnt. And I think it's important to emphasise the latter, engaging students in the thinking and acting. And sometimes it's not always possible to provide students with work ex place experiences, so it's important to provide um, activities of that kind in educational institutions. So, for instance, different countries have different traditions. Whereas in Germany, there's a very strong tradition of providing workplace experiences. In the next door country, Netherlands, there's a strong tradition of not providing um, students experiences. And I think there's similar things in France. But in Netherlands, what they do is they have um, activities which they refer to as hybrid activities, which are simulated work activities that are undertaken within the... Um, uh, within the, the colleges there. But also there's other activities such as one of the polytechnics I do some work with in Singapore, in the information technology area, the students, the IT students, their responsibility is to work with students who come into the, uh, into the polytechnic to set up their computers and when they have problems, it's the IT students that support the other students. So what they get the experience of is engaging in authentic IT tasks and dealing with all sorts of different kinds of, 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 of computers and tablets and things. So the students do that. The students also man a, um, uh, sorry, staff a, um, a, a, a helpline. So they're on, on, the, on the phone. And they, the students also uh, monitor the internet traffic coming into the institution and have the responsibility of identifying malicious emails and malicious things. So they're engaged in those activities in an authentic way. And there can be individual projects, such as the ones I had my students engaging with in making, designing and making garments, um, which is, for instance, guided by a teacher, but opportunities to share experience with others about what they've done. Now, the workplace um, experience, is, I think we all uh, would accept, is very, very important where possible. And we know that this is important for developing occupational capacities and understanding the requirements of particular work situations. And what uh, we know is that workplaces provide authentic activities and interactions, that these experiences are richly context contextual, so they're remembered, that it's, it's, it's part of that whole process remembering and it, which aids recall. And it's multisensory and provides cues and cues how to progress and that students are engaged in purposive activities. They're actually engaged in goal-directed activities. And it's important then that they have the so they get the opportunity often to practice, to, to do things more than once, etc. And that they engage in experiences which are episodic from which they learn. They have quite different experiences perhaps than in educational settings. And they can often monitor the progress of their activities and see the outcomes of their activities. So we all know that's, that's powerful. And, but they also have a range of weaknesses and limitations. Students can learn bad practices. They can learn limit, have limited um, sets of experiences. So there's, there's problems with it. 
So these experiences need to be provided and integrated with those in the vocational education program so that we get these two sets of experiences um, integrated. Um, sorry, what have I done oh, yeah. So if we look at workplaces, going back to this PIAC data, what workers say um, in these three countries here, and the same from other countries, is that it's interesting in terms of their reporting of how they learn in the workplace, they're asked questions about how often do you learn from co-workers and supervisors, and how often is your learning personally mediated? And in every country I've looked at so far, um, what's interesting is that workers more frequently report that it's their mediated, personally mediated learning, which is, is, that is more frequent than being assisted by somebody else. Now, at one level, that's not surprising, because people can't, won't constantly be getting the support from supervisors. But I think what it emphasizes is the importance of learning through individuals' own mediated <coughs> actions as they're engaging in work and perhaps with, with other workers. And this appears to be the case for all classes of workers. And again, I've only got them by educational levels for these three countries. But you see similar patterns across these three countries that learning from co-workers, but also learning through work as, as, being, um, uh, as being consistent. I've no idea why France, and perhaps you know <coughs> why France is so high here in terms of people claiming to learn through every day through their work by their own um, mediation of their learning. No idea why that is. Now, what I've done is, um, in an earlier study, is identified models of uh, workplace curriculum, models of pedagogic practice which support learning in the workplace, and the importance of personal epistemological practice. And I'm not going to go into that. All I'm simply saying is that I've got some print versions of that pamphlet here, should you be interested. And unfortunately, I brought far too many English ones, so if you want to brush up on your English, there, there you go. So please um, take those at the end. So I'm not going to linger on that now. But what I want to refer to is how we can integrate the two sets of experiences. Um, and and the, the findings here come from a study I undertook for the Australian Learning and Teaching Council. And this was about how we can best integrate those experiences. And um, there was consideration for what kind of curriculum and pedagogic practice we could use to integrate those experiences. And in terms of curriculum practices, it is what is intended, what is enacted, and for me, what is most important is what the students experience. And then pedagogic practice were those what happened before the students went into the workplace during and then after the workplace experience. And the importance of personal practices, how students come to engage and reconcile the experiences in both the workplace and educational setting. And what I argue is that this can assist students identify and structure canonical knowledge, but also situational variations of practice. Now, in this, um, in this handout, which I don't have copies of here, what I um, found was there were certain things that, sorry, certain processes that were important in terms of the intended curriculum, uh, the enacted curriculum, and the experienced curriculum. And I'll just, sorry, I thought I might have highlighted one there. And so here, for instance, is intentionally preparing students before they go into the workplace so that they can play an active role and act, learn actively. And that while they're there, try and find some ways of, of engaging with, um, um, sorry, enacting in ways that um, perhaps augment the experience, but also accounting for students' readiness, what they're ready to do, and try and provide experiences accordingly. And again, with the experience curriculum, that students' interest and readiness um, is, is, is important, plus these things down here. So there's a set of considerations for, cr for curriculum, and there's also a set of uh, considerations for what happens before the, the students go into the workplace, during, and then after those experiences. So one of the things that we found was important 
is to advise students to be prepared for contestation. So many times students go into the workplace, and I'm sure this doesn't happen in Switzerland, but I know it does from Laurent's research, but um, the student goes in and the, the people in the workplace say, forget that rubbish you've learned at university, vocational education, what we do here is this. Now, of course, that's quite confronting to the student, but if you prepare them ahead of time for it and say, this might happen, and so you need to make decisions about whether what we've taught you is rubbish or, and what is being shown you in the workplace is, is what it is. So prepare them for, for that. Um, and during the workplace, perhaps put in place arrangements so that students can <coughs> interact um, and engage. And we found, for instance, that student nurses in large hospitals feel very lonely and disengaged. And so allowing student nurses to come together to, to share experiences and to support each other was very important. And then finally, after they've had those experiences, um, facilitate the sharing um, of those experiences and allowing students to compare and contrast experiences across a group of peers. And this then allows them, particularly if it's facilitated, to understand what is common about an occupation and perhaps what is specific. So for instance, one group of students who were doing journalism um, at, um, at my university, Griffith University, um, they went to different kinds of journalism workplaces. It was about broadcast journalism, but also about print journalism. And in broadcast, it was about radio, it was about commercial television, and then about um, the, the public broadcaster, the ABC. And then when they went in to do print journalism, it was in quality newspapers, throwaway ones, but also professional magazines. And by bringing the students together, which is what, was, what, what happened, they were able to understand what was common across those tasks and what was different amongst them. So this seems to be a particularly important way of engaging and utilizing <coughs> the student's experience in a way which is highly productive. I move on. Now, just in terms of thinking about how we come to integrate these ex experiences, this is just a table from <coughs> um, a book on the, s on the subject. And I just take two examples because we know there's a whole range of educational purposes for engaging students in um, workplace experiences. And just to take two examples, if, for instance, if you, many students don't know about the occupation, you know, they, it's something they, they've always wanted to do. Um, particularly nursing, for instance, a common thing from nursing students is I've always wanted to be a nurse. But often those young women, largely, have had no experience of nursing. So you don't have an experience of it. So if you're trying to get someone to learn about the occupation, you'd obviously, in terms of timing, early, duration, short, but long enough for the, so they can observe the, the occupation, how it might be organized is perhaps access to variations of nursing, and then engagement might be through observation and perhaps participation in very peripheral tasks and um, getting them to make sense of it. If, for instance, you wanted um, students to learn about variations of an occupation, you might organize the experience in a different way. So depending upon your educational purposes, there's a range of different ways that you might come to um, um, organize and enact ex experiences for, for, um, for, for students. And in terms of um, d promoting adaptability, um, it's, it's engaging students in problem-solving tasks and trying to identify things such as informed principles and that, that promote adaptability. So what I used to do was I used to teach in fashion. And when we used to teach students about how to make garments, cut patterns and make garments, there was no point in getting them to just focus on the garments that were in the shop because by the time they graduated, they're gone. So what you had to do was teach them informed principles about how you cut garment patterns and things. And um, for instance, you would give them something like stride room on a skirt. You would tell them about stride room and how to make the stride room so you know, the person can walk. But you have to get them to consider the kind of fabric which 
it, when you're popping the pattern. So if you can do it a nice big wide skirt and you cut it in a nice soft fabric which is nice and drapey, that's one thing. But if you cut the same pattern in 14 ounce denim, something like this, you'd end up with a tent. <laughs> so you, it's a combination of those things. And there's other principles. The body is divided into eight heads, and that allows us to um, think about proportions. And then there's these other principles which, with menswear, which is what I used to work in, is that uh, at the moment, everything is, we notice everything's very slim. Have you noticed that? And you'll notice also that the lapels are very narrow, and that the pocket flaps are very narrow, and the jackets are short. The trousers are here, but also very, very tight. Now, two or three years' time, guess what? <laughs> we will go back to wider trousers, and you'll see then that you go for wider lapels, wider flaps, longer jackets. You'll also see that the shirt collars get wider. And guess what? The ties, remember the shipper ties? The ties will come back as being wider. So there's these principles that play out, which are important for students. But you also see the same thing in cooking that you can, when you're teaching somebody how to cook, uh, how you cut uh, the, the um, vegetables or the meat determines, for instance, the length of time um, it, it's cooked. And it also, for instance, a combination of spices. If you're interested in Indian food, you'll find that most combinations of Indian f spices come from a region, but they have the same components in them. There's something which um, is, uh, uh, aids in digestion, there's something which is aromatic. There's something which um, is a, um, oh, what's it called? A, um, um, make sure the food is safe. Um, um, it makes sure there's no harm in the food. And then there'll be something which will give it a particular flavor. And that combination it exists, but it, it differs from area to area in India because of what spices are grown there. So there's a, there's a pattern behind that. And with food, for instance, if you look at um, different kinds of food, you can understand about fuel. So, for instance, in countries that don't have lots and lots of forest, they tend to cut things very, very thinly and cook them in watts because they don't want to. They don't have the fuel. Yet, if you have lots of fuel, you can have large lumps of meat, which you cook for for longer periods of time. So, there's all that sort of logic that that's important. Um, and so, it's it's important to try and develop these principles, inform principles that can promote adaptability and also try and engage students in um, uh, understanding and comparing uh, these um, activities. And for instance, engaging in uh, problem solving of the kind of coming up with the correct solution. Now in medical work, this is referred to as differential diagnoses. And what doctors do is they take the condition of the patient and they then work down to what kind of, of condition the patient's got. And they do it by cancelling out options which seem more or less likely. <coughs> and so it's a process of, of, of problem solving. And they go through that. So that's a, an active thinking process that medical students learn and medical doctors practice, which has the same kind of capacity. So for instance, Many years ago, I decided to teach students how to braid patterns. And um, this will be very, very crude, but this is a back of a jacket or something. And this is the front. And what I initially taught them that is on a two inch, this, this was in, in Australia, we had two inches between sizes, not one and a half centimeters we have here that between the front, the center front and the center back, you had to put 24 uh, millimeters in. So three went in there, three went through the shoulder, three through there, and three through there, three through there, three through there, three through there, and three through there, the next circle. So you teach students how to do that on a basic pattern. And then what you would do is you'd introduce things like panels, where they'd have to work how to do that. And of course, Panels on the front, particularly for women, um, where you need to get what's called a bust prominent in the right direction. Do I take that one? 
And you need to get above prominence in the bar to close it. It's very important to see it turning down to the bus prominence. And then later, you would get students to do things like this, to try and grade something such as a sleeve like that. And, you know, that kimono-type garment. And they'd have to apply the basic principles from here. There's also, by the way, as Bill said, there's, there's, um, there's um, length as well. So they'd understand that basically, and then you'd give them a whole set of different garments where they'd have to work out how to do the grades for that. So taking a set of principles and applying it to um, other types of garments. And that was done quite as a very simple exercise. So I'm going on a bit. Um, and so opportunities to apply knowledge in, in different ways. And in terms of um, learning conceptual and symbolic knowledge, there are ways to try and do this. What we know is that knowledge is difficult to, to capture, difficult to access and learn, and it cannot easily be taught. That you have to kind of engage with it. And um, making conceptual and symbolic knowledge accessible and able to be appropriated can be difficult. However, there's strategies such as the use of stories, analogies, explanations, and illustrations. They can be helpful. And anthropology, anthropological studies, provides us lots of examples of the way that people learn this kind of knowledge outside of what we would call <coughs> formal education. But let me give you a, a, an example of, um, of, of this um, more recently, a more recent example, and that is that we need to try and find ways of developing mental models within students to, to learn this stuff. Now, when, I'll just come to this example, when you know, the photocopiers, which we all use, <coughs> when they were first developed, um, they obviously just, they break down from time to time, and rank Xerox had this problem of how to prepare repair workers, technicians to repair photocopiers. First of all, they provided them with manuals, and the manuals got so big they were impossible. Then they ended up providing them with microfiche. I don't know if anybody here remember microfiche, the film, and they would give these technicians microfiche and then readers that they would, wasn't successful, and the manuals got so big. So they ended up using the following strategy. And that was, first of all, they introduced the technicians to how these photocopies worked. They informed them about how these things operated so they had a under basic understanding of the machine. And then what they did was they um, introduced them to experienced technicians who would give them spe specific strategies and heuristics and problem-solving strategies. They would have practical strategies, for instance, don't try and examine the component that requires you to undo 10 screws. First of all, check the component that um, you only have to undo three screws to look at it. Simple practical stuff of to, to try and make things easier. So the first of all, principal understanding of how these things worked, and then engaging experienced technicians with these, these war stories. And as I've been emphasizing, it's, I think it's important that we develop um, students to engage practically as agentic learners and finding activities that are interesting and relevant to them and putting them in the driver's seat. Now, in the time I worked in vocational education as a teacher in fashion, I didn't have any problems with motivation or engagement because the students were making, designing and making their own garments. And they were engaged very effectively in those activities. Um, and they were keen and engaged and I, I guess that's a principle which we might try and think about as being applied, applied more broadly. And also putting them into position to evaluate their work and their peers' work, and importantly, perhaps guide rather than teach. And then finally, the, the importance of provisions of continuing education and training, which is growing across most countries. And we need to find uh, models of, of CET that meet the needs of working age adults who balance three lives, work life, family life, and study life, and being um, flexible and responsive to them. And currently, I've got this large study in Singapore, which is about this very topic. And um, it's interesting, in Singapore, 
And because all these courses are government funded, attendance is compulsory. People have to come. You sign in. And I assume that compulsory attendance would be particularly difficult for working women, women with children. Because in Singapore, people work a long day. And I thought this would be a real problem for working women. And I interviewed them, some of them. And what they said is, no, 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 it's really good. Because if government says I have to be there on Tuesday and Thursday night, I can say to my husband, right, you're looking after the kids then. But if you take that away, it's more difficult for them to negotiate it. So it's kind of important we understand these provisions from the perspective of the working adult. Um, adults have lots of experience. We need to draw upon that, not do what I'm doing now, just teaching and trying to find activities and we might need to be um, compulsory. And in terms of the kind of processes that we engage in, these should be you know, work-based processes, group-based processes. And the one of the things that I'm looking at a lot at the moment is what's called pedagogically rich activities. These are part of everyday work activities which have great pedagogic potential. The reason for doing that is what we found is that when people go off to training programs, a, they're not effective, they're time consuming, people can't get away. So if we can find learning opportunities that exist in people's everyday work, and the kind of ones I'm looking at in healthcare are nurses' handovers, uh, when the nurses change shifts and inform the, the incoming shift about the patients, etc. Looking at mortality and morbidity meetings that doctors have about patients who have died or really sick and also uh, ward rounds where they go around and discuss the patients. And I'm finding other examples in other sectors. And the important point here is that these events are often comprised of situations where there's a real problem that people are talking about. People articulate views on how, what the problem is and how to respond to it. And people can engage and critically listen to what is going on and form their own views about it. And because oftentimes the tasks continue in their work life, they can see whether what was initially discussed in the meeting actually comes to fruition, sorry, uh, continues into practice. So um, these, these are the kind of things I'm looking at to try and find new models of, um, of professional development. And I think it's important that teachers are tolerant of and able to use the contribution of adult learners and those who possess expertise that, and have the expertise that makes them credible. Okay, just to finish then, um, I think that vocational education goals need to go beyond the canonical knowledge, which is often what governments propose as needs to be addressed. And that um, a view of curriculum and pedagogies that focus upon developing <coughs> adaptability within a domain of knowledge seems to be important. And that finding ways of engaging students in appropriating the canonical knowledge, but also the actual situational requirements is um, a basis for that adaptability. And this includes trying to find, have educational interventions which assist the development of this hard to learn symbolic and conceptual <coughs> knowledge and promoting lear learner agency and interdependence within all of that. And in all, a focus on learning and not just teaching. So I'll just finish there. Sorry, um, have I gone terribly over time? No, no. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Very much. Thank you.